the uh, Laura F. Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies at the uh, Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. I welcome you. My name is Brian Haugut. I'm the director of the Willis Center. And uh, I would just like to take a minute to introduce our guest today. Uh, we have the pleasure of, uh, of uh, hearing from John Christopher Thomas, Clarence J. Abbott Professor of Biblical Studies at the Pentecostal Theological Seminary in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, uh, Dr. Thomas uh, has uh, uh, theology degrees from Ash Ashland Theology Seminar, Princeton Theological Seminar, and or seminary, and the uh, his PhD is from the University of Sheffield uh, in England. And he, uh, as in addition to his professorship, he's the director of the Center of Pentecostal and Charismatic S Studies. Uh, Bangor University in Wales, and also the director of the Center for Pentecostal Theology uh, in, uh, at the Pentecostal Theology Seminar. He's an, also an associate pastor at uh, Woodward Avenue Church of God, Athens, Tennessee. So he's a very busy man, apparently. Lot, lots going on there. And let me just share with you very briefly just a little bit of what he's uh, some of his interests. He's the editor of uh, the Journal of Pentecostal Theology that comes out of Brill. Uh, he's also the editor of the Journal of Pentecostal Theolo Theology Seminar Series, and he's also general, general editor of Pentecostal uh, Commentary Series. Uh, I counted about a hundred publications on this, so I, I can't go through all those, but uh, uh, he's, he's done things with uh, uh, foot washing in John 13 in the Johannine community. Uh, he's very interested in the book of Revelation and has something forthcoming uh, through Erdman's. And uh, so he's, I think, what about eight books, something like that, that, that you've published? Uh, and what's really interesting is that he likes the Book of Mormon. And he enjoys reading the Book of Mormon, and he enjoys studying the Book of Mormon, and he enjoys writing about the Book of Mormon. Uh, which he will tell you about. And so uh, I'm, we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, first we'll have Dr. Uh, Matthew Gray from uh, Ancient Scripture give us a prayer, and then we'll turn the time over to uh, Dr. Thomas. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be together this morning and to welcome Dr. Chris Thomas uh, to be with us. We're so thankful for, for him and his ability to, uh, to join us and to be on campus. We're thankful for the opportunity to be together this morning and to listen to his message and his research uh, that he's been doing on the Book of Mormon. We're thankful for our shared uh, interest and love in that book, and we pray that the Spirit will, uh, will be with Dr. Thomas and that it will also be with us as we uh, listen to his uh, uh, message and his research, that we will all be informed and inspired together, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see all of you. Um, I'm tempted just to visit a while, but I will quench the spirit in that regard. Let me begin with a testimony, which is big in your circles as it is in mine. My initial encounter with the Book of Mormon came in January of 74, 41 years ago. I visited the visitor's center on Temple Square in Salt Lake City. The, Cur the Turing Choir, of which I was a part, was making its way across the United States, and we were heading back to the southeast. We visited the impressive Mormon Tabernacle, and complete with the acoustic demonstrations, and as musicians, we were all very impressed. And then we stopped by the visitor center, after the orientation presentation, some of us accepted a copy of the Book of Mormon, which was the iconic blue cover with the angel Moroni appearing on it. Little did I know that the reception of this copy would be the first of numerous encounters with Mormonism and its distinctive book over the next four decades. The next few years would be marked by my becoming acquainted with Mormonism through extended conversations with Mormon missionaries, some of whom's names I can still recall, one unfortunately named missionary, Norman, 
who in Tennessee became Norman the Mormon. Uh, Non-Mormon literature responding to Mormon claims, a graduate course on Mormon history from its beginnings through Nauvoo, which was actually built around a home study course from BYU on early church history. So I guess I'm an alum. Uh, I, I was keeping that from Brian, I think. Um, I've done extensive readings on the Book of Mormon and finally actually did a graduate level reading course on the Book of Mormon just the last couple of years. But as this journey began, I could not have imagined that one day I would be here at Brigham Young University. Lecturing on the Book of Mormon is a bit like in England, they always talked about Newcastle being the home of coal and so if they thought something was redundant, they would say it's like bringing coals to Newcastle, and I do feel a bit that way. As often has been observed, you don't really have to have read the Book of Mormon to have an opinion about the Book of Mormon. In point of fact, opinions about the Book of Mormon often have little to do with the book itself. There have been long stretches of time, so I have learned, uh, courtesy of Grant, uh, there in the back, when some of those for whom the book functions as scripture, even the LDS Church itself and its leaders paid comparatively little attention to the Book of Mormon as worship services, theology, teachings, and dare I say, the curriculum at BYU. But Book of Mormon studies uh, as a discipline, it seems, is complicated to an outsider because I don't know who quite qualifies as a Book of Mormon scholar. You could argue it's ancient Near Eastern folk. You could argue it's 19th century folk. You could argue it's theologians. You could argue in any way. In fact, Book of Mormon scholarship reminds me very much of the Olympics in that the scholarship is, for the most part, amateurs. Now, understand what I'm saying. An Olympic champion may be the best person in the world in their event, but they got a day job. Lots of Mormon scholarship, Book of Mormon scholarship, has come from pe people who have day jobs, who are lawyers or engineers or all kinds of different things. And so trying to figure out the lay of the land has been a bit of a challenge. If you review the monograph link studies, you find that most of the literature on the Book of Mormon comes from those for whom it functions as scripture not only the LDS tradition, but Community of Christ and a host of others. But as Bob Dylan said all those years ago, the times they are changing. As more folk from outside, in my outdated parlance, Gentiles are looking at the Book of Mormon. Yet despite the plethora of studies devoted to the book, I was disappointed to learn that few of them addressed many of the issues that I brought to the text. For most of the works, whatever the topic or method were seen primarily interested in whether or not the Book of Mormon is historically true or false, whether it's verifiable or not. Certainly important issues, but not the only issue. Oddly to me, at any rate, even some works devoted to literary approaches wound up being forced into the service of this evidentialist approach an approach that I don't have much interest in, even amongst biblical scholars. My own interests are, lit are primarily literary and theological, with extensive interests in reception history. And so what I have found is that despite the variety of books devoted to it, the Book of Mormon has only recently begun to receive the kind of attention in these ways that I am interested in. I mentioned in particular Grant Hardy's understanding the Book of Mormon as one of those sort of turning points. So I'm interested in identifying the structure, the literary genre, the content of the books or the book, topics that often receive only passing attention, even in works that set out as their stated aim to examine such issues. I'm interested in locating the textual indicators that serve to guide readers through the narrative. 
I'm interested in the theology of the Book of Mormon, not just a comparison of the book's theological orientation with that of the Bible, as various folk have done, but rather the major theological emphases that emerge from the pages of the Book of Mormon itself and the categories that emerge from the Book of Mormon. I'm interested in the book's impact on followers and opponents alike, as well as the imprint it's left on music and art, and even some examples of disastrous interpretations of the book. I'm interested in placing the Book of Mormon and Pentecostalism, my own tradition, a spirit movement, prophetic, etc. I'm interested in putting them into dialogue by identifying a variety of issues on which the two speak, their similarities and differences, offering a Pentecostal assessment of the book. And only after hearing from the book on its own terms am I interested in taking up the knotty issues of origins. In today's lecture, I propose to look to offer an overview of the monograph I'm working on, which stands at about 350 pages, so I've been cutting vociferously ever since getting the kind invitation by Brian, uh, whom I owe a lot to. If I didn't thank you, Brian, thanks so very much. I'm going to give uh, maybe five, uh, five soundings, I would like to call them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the book. I'm going to give a, an example of how literary issues impact how we read the content of the book. I'll give an example of the theology of the book, and then <clears throat> some examples out of reception history, and just a, a, a snippet on Pentecostalism in the Book of Mormon, time uh, allowing. So, the structure of the Book of Mormon. I know you would not be familiar with this list, so I thought I'd put it up on the board. As an amateur reader of the Book of Mormon, I began with the 1830 edition by making it not a, an original edition, but a, a copy. Don't, don't envy me too much. By making an attempt to identify the structure of the book from a literary or narrative perspective. And I'm not interested in how it historically comes, whether Mosiah is first written, etc., but rather the narrative order itself. And although it contains a variety of literary forms, epistle, sermon, prophetic, oracle, testimony, unlike the Bible, the Book of Mormon is for the most part one extended narrative comprised of various books, as you all know. Thus, at one level, identifying the book's structure could be thought of as arranging the book's content, arranging it in the order in which they appear, such as my little uh, superfluous slide here. You know that order. However, a closer examination reveals that the macrostructure of the narrative takes shape around the central writers or editors, Mormon and Moroni in particular, as their names occur in strategic locations throughout the book. For example, both names appear on the title page. I'm going to refrain from reading the title page. You know all about that. Such prominence on the title page leads the readers to expect that both figures will have more than a passing significance in the page pages to follow. And I would say that it is difficult to underestimate the structural significance of Mormon and Moroni for the book. For not only do they appear together as an inclusio around the entire narrative, the title page, and you end up with Moroni's work, but they also often appear together at a variety of strategic locations throughout orienting, as it were, the readers as to their location in the broader composition. You can sometimes get lost in the Book of Mormon if you're an amateur reading like myself. Apprising them, the reader, of the specific plates and records that are being relied upon, assuring the readers of the trustworthiness of the accounts. In each case, it seems that Mormon, Moroni, or both appear when the narrative introduces a new set of plates from which the record is drawn. Thus standing at the beginning and at the end of the small plates of Nephi 
at the end of the other plates of Nephi, and on either side of the plates found by the people of, and you'll have to help me with my pronunciation, Limhi or Limhi? Limhi, that was not a rhetorical question. Mormon or Moroni appear as structural markers for the readers. In other words, you encounter them along your journey, providing recognizable landmarks to guide the readers. So in this light, the structure of the book might be presented in the following ways, with the bold face type. Now my friend Grant Hardy, I know, includes Nephi in this, but Nephi functions in a different way, literarily, it seems to me, than do Mormon and Moroni. So that's one of the things that helped me kind of find my way through this strange book. Next is what I would call chronological indicators. The strategic appearances of Mormon and Moroni are not the only keys to its structure. Another set of clues comes in the form of chronological and or temporal indicators found in various sections of the book. Whilst a variety of indicators appear in a variety of contexts, there are three main sets of such indicators that give the narrative a sense of movement and contribute to a sense of the book's macrostructure. From very near the beginning of the book, time begins to be measured based on the number of years that have passed from the moment Lehi left Jerusalem. Okay, and you see the, the three here. We're going to look in a little more detail at a couple of them. There are 17 such indicators scattered throughout the Book of Mormon. This means of calculation overlaps with the next, that is, the 100-year reign of the judges. Ninety of those uh, appear, that ninety of those 100 years are mentioned with the judges, which calculation gives way to time being measured in terms of the birth of Christ. And I had far too many of these, but that's the first one. This is the judges. I know you can't read them, but I wanted to impress you with my skills. Uh, this is a bit more legible kind of division. Then you get the um, birth of Jesus kind of calculations. And I wanted to go here. Now, as you can see, I hope you can see, in this accompanying chart, I'm very technologically challenged, uh, it is clear that the three primary mo modes of marking chronology in the book work together to guide the reader through its contents. First, uh, well, I'm sorry, since the first two chronological markers conclude at the same time, and since their conclusions overlap with the beginning of the final marker, it may be suggested that the period of overlap is a most uh, significant and remarkable time. It is not surprising, then, that this remarkable convergence takes place in and around the coming of Christ, as described in 3rd Nephi, indicating the significance of these events in the book's narrative. So I think, you know, to, to kind of a, a stranger to the Book of Mormon, I was amazed to find those indicators and the way they overlap. A lot of people noticed the indicators, but as far as I could tell, nobody actually goes from beginning to end following them. So a structure, a little bit there. I want to talk a little bit as well about content, and I want to talk about the most read book in the Book of Mormon, so the Hardys tell me, First Nephi, because as you know, everybody starts reading the book, but sometimes they don't make it very far. It came as quite a surprise to me that none of the monographs I've read on the Book of Mormon gave more than a sampling of the book's contents. In fact, they often choose the same stories to tell what's in the Book of Mormon. But I've, in my book, devote a fair amount of t uh, space to kind of a survey of the contents, probably about 100 pages, where I look at literary issues to set up the discussion of the content of the book. And I want to give one example, and this is from 1 Nephi. 1 Nephi is a 22 chapter book 
covers about 45 pages, the 1830 edition, contains about 26,000 words. Owing to a significant structural marker in the text, it appears that the book falls into three major parts, each of which concludes with the phrase, and thus it is, amen. Now based on the strategic locations of this phrase, a tripartite structure emerges, consisting of the following. Lehi and his sons. Nephi becomes a spirit-empowered spokesperson. Nephi leads the community. Now, I'm going to skip over the first part. I assume you know all about such matters, especially since it stands so close to the beginning. Uh, part two we'll pick up. The con when, you, when we examine the contents of part two in narrative order, it becomes clear that the entire portion is devoted to establishing Nephi as an authorized, spirit-inspired spokesperson, as his father before him. As this part begins, the readers are told that Nephi will now begin an account of his own stuff, and yet he doesn't do that. He begins with that of his father and brothers. Now, one could take this as an unnecessary diversion, uh, but that would be to miss the fact that Nephi is being established here. One could say in some ways that Nephi's activities are rooted and grounded in that of his father. When the readers first make their way to this portion, they have a rather high opinion of Nephi, especially when compared to his brothers, but there is still some distance between their opinion of Nephi and their opinion of Lehi. However, in this section, Nephi is transformed almost before their very eyes, into an authorized spirit-inspired spokesperson, like his father's. The readers learn that not only does Lehi prophesy about all manner of things, I'm going to assume your knowledge of the storyline there, the magnitude of such things uh, that were revealed by the power of the Holy Ghost created within Nephi a desire to know such spirit-inspired mysteries for himself something for which he prays in chapter 10. In his subsequent conversation with the spirit, Nephi sees the same tree, asks for its interpretation. Um, all kinds of th things take place here. I'm going to skip over because I know you know all of those things. Uh, but what we see in this kind of recounting is that by means of his encounter with the Spirit, Nephi sees more of redemptive history unfold before him in astonishing detail than any Spirit-inspired spokesperson before him, before him in the Hebrew Bible or before him in 1 Nephi to this point, uniquely qualifying him for his task as well as underscoring the truthfulness of the events described in the plates that followed. And then when we come to the end of this section, we get our phrase that lets us know something about the third point. As we get into the third part of First Nephi, the readers have a very high expectation level uh, to discern what's going on. And what happens with Nephi is he begins to rival his father Lehi and even serves as the interpreter of his father's hard sayings for his brothers. This interpretation includes all manner of things that you know about. Significantly, Nephi's own spirit-inspired activity is bounded on, by, on either side by the phrase, now all these things were said and done as my father dwelt in a temple. Uh, my bad, <laughs> Freudian slip. In a tent in the valley, which he called Lemuel. I've been asking Brian to get me in the temple, but he's reluctant. Suggesting that though present, Lehi is no longer the center of spirit-inspired activity in this section. This message is further reinforced by the fact that after Nephi, his brothers, and his brothers take for themselves wives from the daughters of Ishmael, as noted, and thus my father had fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord which he had given him. And though Lehi will continue to have a major role in hearing the voice of the Lord and offering commands based upon such divine directives, these words suggest that more and more Nephi is, it will stand at the center stage with the future of the book focusing more exclusively upon his activities. 
And I hope what you see is the way that the literary markers help divide the text, and then it makes you reread the text in ways that sometimes get away from us. Uh, I do have, uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but I wanted to throw up on the screen there, third Nephi. And just to point out, notice that each of these four sections end with Mormon's words. It's almost as though Mormon is directing us in terms of how uh, this is to be um, constructed and experienced. Um, I've got too much here. Uh, there is this great thing, though. Let me just go back for one second. Alma 23 through 27, uh, the story of the Lamanite converts who become pacifists, is at the very center of the book. It's at the very physical center of the Book of Mormon. Uh, uh, John, is John Hilton? He, John, thank you. I've never met John. We've worked virtually together a lot. John helped me do the word count. Narratively, that's very significant in the, by the book. Uh, theology of the Book of Mormon. There are a lot of theological features in the book that have not been explored. This task is complicated, oddly enough, uh, by the fact that it has not received much attention at all. At least from my vantage point, it's not received the kind of attention I would have imagined a book of scripture would receive. There are a couple of major exceptions to this rule. Dale, Luff, Dale Luffman uh, from the Community of Christ has perhaps done as much as any on the theology of the Book of Mormon, uh, save uh, it is Charlie Harrell. Charlie waved to the crowd. Uh, this is my testimony, which uh, I have... Uh, had a lot of conversation with Charlie about, but he's not responsible for any of my deviances. Um, I think one of the reasons why this is the case is because of, of uh, continuing revelation. Uh, Jim Faulkner somewhere has said that one of the reasons why you don't get theology proper is because everything's provisional. And so if that's the case, uh, that would be true with the Book of Mormon. Now, the themes that I have located in the book, let me see, there we go, are these. Seems like you've got to discuss God, Christ, the Holy Ghost, the fall, atonement, salvation, ecclesiologies, angels, war and peace, the theology of the plates, eschatology, and, and uh, a, a couple of small ones, murmuring, uh, the role of women, Polygamy and hell. It's a good place to end, isn't it? Hell. Now you can tell him we had a Pentecostal and he preached the hell briar, fire and brimstone sermon to us. Now in the section on Christology, this is how I develop what I find in the Book of Mormon into these categories. You have a pre-Christian knowledge and pre-Christian acts of Christ. You have resurrection appearances of Jesus to the Nephites in the Americas. You have Jesus' titles and identities, and you have Jesus and the uh, atonement. What I want to do is just lift up one of those, the pre-Christian knowledge and activities of Jesus. Oops. One of the most radical aspects of the Book of Mormon is the fact that throughout the narrative, references made to details indicating that Book of Mormon peoples had access to considerable pre-Christian knowledge of Christ. Examples of such knowledge you know very well, and I have page after page after page of this. I mean, that's one of the distinctive features uh, of the Book of Mormon. Let me get on down, skipping around here. Apparently, Jesus even appears uh, before the incarnation. And so we all know about that. But it's one thing to have such unique events as these narrated. It's quite another to try to make some theological sense of them. While such phenomenon might be dismissed out of hand as not being capable of a theological explanation, the Book of Mormon itself offers something of a way forward. In Alma's words, 
of instruction to his son, Corianton, in Alma 39, 17 through 19, where he talks about not marveling about what should be known so long beforehand, for is not a soul at this time as precious to God as a soul will be at the time of his coming. You know the text. You can fill in the rest. Clearly, the implication is that it is fundamentally unfair for one generation to have access to the details of Jesus and his salvific mission, while another one does not. The theological exclamation suggests that it would be very surprising if such details were not available across the generations, for God is certainly capable of accomplishing this task in short order. And to do otherwise would be extraordinarily unfair. As such, these words not only offer an explanation for this, this distinctive aspect of the Book of Mormon, but also might be a subtle critique of the comparatively limited revelation of such details in the Old Testament, indicating something of the book's view of its own unique value. Well, if this is the theological rationale for the appearance of such pre-Christian details, how might these details be thought of in constructing a Christology of the Book of Mormon? Recently, this theological challenge has been addressed by the proposal that this entire phenomenon might be helpfully described in theological terms as realized missiology. Drawing on the way in which scholars of the Johannine literature in the New Testament have often spoken of the book's eschatological teaching as realized eschatology, you can see it in phrases like, already you are judged, already you have eternal life. The effects of the end already felt in the present. Nick Frederick has proposed a similar understanding of the pre-Christian messianism found in the Book of Mormon. Specifically, this move suggests that Christ's presence and mission is so powerful even before his coming to earth that it breaks into the pre-Christian era, resulting in a messianism, the power of which is felt and known equally before, during, and after the Messiah's appearance to the Nephites after his resurrection. And I, was Nick able to make it? Uh, Nick? Well done. Uh, I, I just think that that is a very clever uh, way of naming a phenomenon that people haven't quite known what to do with. Now, if I had unlimited time, uh, in Pentecost, you, you do, you know, you just keep going. Whoever's got the microphone's got the service. Uh, I would have talked to us about the role of speaking in tongues in the Book of Mormon, a lot there. I would have talked about war and peace and the way in which Alma 23 through 27, among other texts, kind of orient that discussion. I would have talked about women in the Book of Mormon and their relatively limited role as kind of props um, identified by their relationship to some male. Um, and I've come up with some really clever stuff there, sisters, but I don't have time, sorry. Uh, I want to talk some about reception history. That is, what impact has this book had on a variety of things? And I'm not going to give you time uh, much to read this, but I want to begin with music. And my first point has to do with, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm going way ahead. Let me go back just a second. I uh, start with uh, reception history, groups for whom the Book of Mormon functions as scripture, a number of groups now. Uh, Strang is very interesting. He seems to have tried to relive Joseph's life. He has plates. He gets elected to the state legislature in Michigan and serves about three terms. He starts out anti-polygamist and becomes a polygamist. It's a fascinating story there. Uh, lots of different groups here. Then I even look at some early Gentile responses uh, when the thing is first published. Alexander Campbell's famous uh, assessment and Mark Twain's even more famous assessment. And if you can read things and laugh at yourself, Twain is delightful. If you can't, I wouldn't bother. Uh, 
Well, let me say a word about music. This comes from the early hymnal that uh, Emma has a hand in doing, and it is uh, about the red man. It's very uh, politically incorrect now in some ways, but uh, it shows very clearly the signs of the Book of Mormon, the influence. It shouldn't come as a surprise that the teaching of the Book of Mormon with regard to Native Americans would turn up in a hymn of the movement, and it turns up, what is it, I think in 35 even, it's very early. The song begins with an inquiry on the part of the worshipers as to the origins and identity of the red man, which offers the opportunity for the Native American not only to answer this seemingly straightforward question, but to offer unwitting testimony to the Book of Mormon and the views found therein with regard to the origins of Native Americans. In most every verse of each stanza, the influence of the book can be detected, specifically the description of this symbolic figure's stately comportment in the second stanza, which reflects the general attitude of the Book of Mormon about the potential of the Nephites and Lamanites for righteous and noble lives. The hymn then shifts to focus on the man's response. Three major emphases are revealed in the native's response. First, his words confirm that the Book of Mormon has reported what the Book of Mormon has reported about the origins and history of Native American Native peoples, that North American Native peoples, that he is descended from Jacob, the patriarch, from Ephraim's lineage. Second, as described in the Book of Mormon, the speaker confirms the fall of this godly race of people into darkness, etc., etc. Third, the hope found in the Book of Mormon for conversion of the Lamanites is heard in the last three stanzas. I won't um, uh, say any more there, but I just wanted you to get a flavor of, of uh, its impact in music. The other example I have that I'm not talking, going to talk about is uh, the musical, The Book of Mormon, which, uh, and, and you know, feel free if you can laugh there. If it gets you in trouble, then don't laugh. Uh, which, interestingly enough, has very little to do with The Book of Mormon, except... Uh, Joseph, the All-American Prophet, I think, is, is the title of that. Reception history seeks not to do a history of interpretation, but rather to trace the effects of texts. And so you can clearly see that in this hymn. The next thing I want to do is look at art and the Book of Mormon. It should come as no surprise that the Book of Mormon has been influential in a variety of ways with visual artists. I want to begin with David Hiram Smith. Uh, perhaps the first extant painting that we have of a Book of Mormon scene. This one comes from the brush of the son with whom Emma was pregnant when Joseph was murdered. David Hiram would become known for his missionary activity, his poetry, his songs, and his paintings within the reorganized LDS church. He was a sensitive and artistic young man producing several famous paintings of scenes from in and around Nauvoo, where he spent much of his life. What's not always appreciated about David as the artist is the fact that he seems to have had the earliest extant painting of a scene in the Book of Mormon. The date is somewhat uncertain, but appears to come from 1873 and 74. Uh, the word Plano is on the back of the canvas in two locations. That's the period that David lived in Plano. Uh, ultimately, he would be institutionalized, uh, having had a nervous breakdown. It's a very sad story, uh, is the story of David. Um, but he paints this picture of Lehi's dream of the Tree of Life. The painting is based upon a scene described in 1 Nephi 8. Uh, this is uh, courtesy, we're able to see this uh, courtesy of the uh, Community of Christ Visitor Center in Nauvoo. And um, uh, so you, this is one of the first times it's, it's being shown around and, and I have to send, them, send it back to them when I finish this lecture. <laughs> it's about 25 inches by 19 inches, oil on canvas, depicts Lehi led by a man dressed in white, standing by the tree that bore white fruit. Lehi is depicted as looking back over his left shoulder at his wife, way in the distance, you can just barely make him out, Sarah and his son Sam 
and Nephi, motioning to them with his right hand, in which he holds some white fruit, whilst his left hand is holding on to the iron rope wrapped around the tree, apparently stretching back along the river. In the distant background, the tiny figures to whom he looks are barely visible. Across the river, in which individuals are pictured in the act of drowning, you can see a couple of them in the river, is a spacious building almost suspended in midair, in which can be seen individuals in fine attire, pointing at Lehi in derision for eating the tree's fruit. As in the story from one Nephi, Lehi is clearly the dominant figure in the painting. This is underscored in three ways. First, he is in the foreground, not the background. He's almost literally the center of the scene. Second, his large size emphasizes his importance in the painting. While the man in white, perhaps the angelic guide, is slightly larger than Lehi, indicating his own experience, Lehi dwarfs all the other figures. His location near and his physical contact with the tree, by means of the iron rod and the fruit he holds in his hand, indicate that whilst others are destroyed and even mock him, Lehi is successful in his salvific pursuit. Interestingly, all of the figures appear to be Caucasians, suggesting something about the way in which David's context influenced how he experienced and internalized the story. The next person is Reuben Kirkham. In the early 1880s, the Book of Mormon would have an impact on a distinctive contemporary art form. From the spring 83 to January 84, Utah LDS artist Reuben Kirkham would design and complete a series of 23 scenes from the Book of Mormon to be displayed in panoramic fashion, interspersed with songs, musical pieces, as well as various character sketches for, for uh, which uh, Kirkham was widely known. Uh, I list all those scenes and we won't have time to go through that. We know that the presentation, according to the Ogden Daily Herald, uh, was witnessed and approved by the leaders of the church on the 5th of March in 84. Uh, the panorama played scores of times throughout Utah. Despite this successful run, sadly, none of the original panels are extant. Though a photo of, photo of Alma baptizing in the waters of Mormon does exist in private hands. The picture of it uh, from, for educational purposes, from Donna Poulton's Reuben Kirkham. This panel depicts the Book of Mormon scene as occurring in a grove with Alma and a male candidate standing in the midst of a small pool of water surrounded by a variety of onlookers, both male and female. There, there is one small pr child present as well. All the onlookers have the appearance of being Caucasians, attired in clothing normally associated with biblical times. The photo shows something, I think, of the intricacy of detail and artistry of Kirkham's paintings, work that made the Book of Mormon story available to hundreds, perhaps even thousands in this form. The final uh, example comes from someone well known to this community, uh, Minerva Teichert. Um, I'm not gonna give you everything I have here. She has an enormous productivity, murals, that are most, I think, are here at BYU, which she interested, interesting, interestingly traded to the university for tuition for her children and other worthy students. Um, this is one of my favorites. Actually, it is my favorite. Uh, she was fond of putting in women where women weren't actually described but were implied. And so this is the love story where wives are being taken uh, by uh, Lehi's lads. Uh, the resulting mural depicts five females clad in festive and colorful garments in the scene's center, celebrating their weddings with dancing, the playing of tambourines, while horns and cymbals are in the hands of the males that accompany them. This mural, in my estimation, is classic Tykert, 
where a, de a detail in the Book of Mormon is teased out, making the inclusion of women quite overt, whereas the, the text is considerably more reticent about such. Notice, the final thing I'll say about her, is notice that they're not all Caucasians, that she's contextualized the figures uh, in what was emerging at that time to be possibly Mexican or Central American uh, descent. Let me just uh, very quickly mention two or three things to you. Disastrous interpretation of the Book of Mormon. There were two sets of murders, one that were on the fringes of the LDS community, another on the fringes of the, uh, at that time, RLDS community. One set here in Utah, not far from here actually, one said in Kirtland. In both cases, the spirit's command to uh, Nephi to murder Laban is appealed to by those who commit the murders. Now, I've got a section on disastrous interpretations of the book of Revelation in my commentary, so I'm not picking on the Book of Mormon. Uh, this doesn't mean that that was the intention, but this is sometimes what occurs. Uh, the very final thing I will do is quickly give you a sampling of Pentecostalism in the Book of Mormon. Edward Irving begins the Irvingites. We know that an Irvingite pastor came and consulted with Joseph Smith and Kirtland about amalgamating. Alexander Dowie, colorful figure, healer, comes across the United States, stops in Salt Lake, has extensive conversations with the, the authorities about becoming an apostle. When he was informed it doesn't quite work that way, uh, he left condemning the whole lot of them, went to Chicago, established a place called Zion City, which would, would um, be reminiscent of Nauvoo in terms of the way it was put together. Uh, and at the end of his life, decided that he was going to bring 6,000 evangelists to Utah and convert the whole lot of the Mormons, to which the leaders of the Mormon church said, come on. What nobody knew, and we now know from various documents, is that Dowie, this is 1905, that Dowie was going to say that God had led him to reinstitute polygamy. Well, you're still in the shadow <laughs> of lots of things that you know more about in that history than I do. But that was an amazing strategy, it would seem to me. Well, I've, I've used up all of my time and more, but we might have, Brian, do we have any time for questions? Okay, all right, that's not the reason people usually leave when I'm speaking, so that, that's good to know. Uh, questions, observations, yeah. John Turner's magnificent biography of Brigham Young, where he traces glossolalia in Young's life, really got my attention. And, and it seems to me that a lot about the continuation of gifts functions in some ways, as it has in Pentecostalism, as this is evidence, this is the sign that the Spirit is amongst us. Uh, I do a section on gifts and a section on tongues. Uh, there are some similarities, some differences. It is amazing to me, one of the things that's amazing to me about it with the Book of Mormon, and I, I know this is not history as such, but is how quickly it begins to become institutionalized. Uh, so that in my tradition, uh, there's a real, in its best form, as in, you know, I would expect it to be looking at in your tradition, um, there's a real democratization of the spirit so that at any point in a worship service someone can be used with the gift of prophecy. Uh, which, which when things start moving in that way for Joseph and Kurt, Kirtland, he kind of shuts down and then Brigham will shut it down on a couple of occasions. So I, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. 
I couldn't find in the history stuff a lot of definition about glossolalic experiences. Uh, in my tradition, I know that from kind of the inside, but it's, it's been difficult to kind of piece that together. Yeah, I think there was a hand back up here. Yeah. I would say yes <laughs> to that. I mean, I, I certainly understand it, but I think what, what people like Grant Hardy have said is the issue of origins is a non-starter. You know, we can't talk, to, as he would say, we, we can't really talk to people outside the tradition if that's where we start. And so what about talking about things we can talk about and we can examine together? And in some ways, I'm, I'm kind of uh, picking that, that up. Well, by its location, yeah, 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 by its location, it, it's kind of the center. And you have at the beginning Na uh, uh, Laban's murder, and you have at the end Mormon kind of saying, put your weapons down, lads, you know, unless God tells you to. But at that point, we're starting to think back about, well, did God really tell Nephi that? Or... Is he saying to us, unless God really tells you to, to be dead certain, no pun intended, <laughs> that you're to take this? The other thing is that located in between those are all these words of Jesus. And the only people who actually live out Jesus' words are the folk in Alma. And those Jesus people, I thought that was the 60s, but apparently not, who get persecuted but do not respond, I think this is the fourth Nephi, but do not respond in kind. Uh, and then you get the words of Mormon later talking about peaceable followers, which kind of gets defined. So it's, and then, of course, I mean, what do you do with uh, um, uh, Mom, I'm drawing a blank, the book Between Mormon and Moroni? Ether. What do you do with Ether? I mean, it's like, you know, all the wars we saw are not enough. We got to be told about two whole groups that everybody but one dies. And I went to see, you know, one of the Lord of the Rings episodes, one of those midnight showings, and I, and I went to sleep. And 20 minutes later, I woke up, and when I went to sleep, they were fighting. And when I woke up, they were fighting. I mean, you know, you kind of you, you get that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you kind of wonder in terms of the Book of Mormon if there's this critique of this dominant theme of war that doesn't clear doesn't neatly seems to me doesn't neatly necessarily get tied off you know the readers are still left with you know that praise of uh, of Moroni the the military leader on the one hand and yet there is this sense of that these pacifists that is even convincing to those that won't let them join them in war because they don't want them damned. Yeah. The reason I the thing that fascinated me is uh, I never found the words. Uh, but you know, at the beginning of first Nephi and verse nineteen, Nephi says, I'm gonna show you the tender mercies of the Lord. And at the end of the book in Mor Moroni, in that uh, three, four, five, it says, and then you pray and God will show you that he has been merciful. Yeah, it was one of those cartoon moments where, where the eyes came out of my head <laughs> and I realized where we were in the book. Well, thank you. Okay.